Good to go, Robert. Hi, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you tuning in from elsewhere. I'm Robert Glasgow, and I'm a partner at McCarthy Tetro in our international trade and investment law group. One of the areas of my practice I specialize in is government procurement work, both helping suppliers avoid problems and help, helping purchasers avoid problems and helping suppliers know when their rights need to be enforced. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. I'd also like to recognize that many of us uh, tuning in from across the country are on their own Indigenous territories. We recognize the enduring presence of the Indigenous peoples on this land and the importance of working to advance reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians here and across Canada. Now, as I said, one of the key parts of my practice is in the sphere of government procurement. One of the key areas of government procurement that's becoming more and more salient to our lives and our practice as procurement professionals and as procurement lawyers are Canada's international trade agreements. Hence, today's the first part of the two-part session on the trade agreements and on getting to know them and some of the obligations behind them. We are then going to turn to the second part of the presentation, which will be uh, the general obligations and general procurement structures in session two on December 1st. So without much further ado, I wanna start with a quick statement of why we care about the procurement market and about procurement structures. And this is perhaps a silly question since you're all here, you obviously care to some degree, but it's important to remember that Canada has an incredibly large public procurement market. Canada's public procurement market is worth more than $130 billion annually when it's split amongst its various different public purchasers at various different governmental levels. This number is also focused on recurring purchases and constant deal stream. This is leaving out the temporary emergency purchases, for example, inspired by the COVID crisis, and leaving aside certain very large procurements done uh, for infrastructure and for uh, military procurements. It's also worth noting another interest of why we care about the public procurement market as a whole is that many provinces and especially sub-provincial entities like school boards, health units, uh, municipalities, have purchased heavily from SMEs, uh, small and medium enterprises. And a lot of these entities have purchased in ways that have not been strictly covered by Canada's trade agreements for many years. This has been changing uh, since the implementation of the CFTA and CETA, but there's still a lot of holdover and there's still a lot of uh, administrative inertia behind some of these purchasing decisions. These entities also usually face the most immediate political pressure from small and medium enterprises to buy local and focus on local purchases and local concerns. But this is just parochially concerned about Canada and the Canadian market. There are other reasons to care deeply about the procurement market from a trade perspective. And that's because Canada has agreements with procurement obligations that cover most of the developed world. Most countries in this world, in the EU, in the United States, in the CPTPP countries, uh, have procurement obligations that extend favorable treatment to Canadian suppliers. If you are a Canadian supplier and you are thinking about expanding the scope of the services you provide and your customer base, having these trade agreements gives you a powerful tool in ensuring fair and reasonable access to these government procurement markets across the world. Finally, turning once more to Canada, one other reason to care for purchasers in particular is that Canada is one of the most, if not the most litigious procurement market in the world. Canada has historically been seen as a jurisdiction in which litigants can capture lost profit damages for unsuccessful attempts to, to sell to the government and thus gain access to a ready stream of cash through engaging in litigation. 
It's thus very important that you stay on side of all of your obligations to try to cut off this funnel and to protect yourselves as purchasers. Very briefly, I won't go over every part of this slide, but this is the rough procurement landscape that you can see in Canada. At the top, you have procurement law and regulation because we have no central procurement law, no central backbone or spine that provides uh, regulations on how procurements are being governed. We then get down into the dual streams of contractual obligations, such as the RON engineering contract A, contract B obligations that we'll be going over more heavily on December 1st, but then also internal obligations. Now, today's focus is gonna be on that left-hand column of the trade agreements, but it's also worth noting that you also have a variety of other statutory instruments that may apply to you as a purchaser or may apply to the procurements you're bidding on. This includes things like the Broader Public Sector Accountability Act, the BPS Procurement Directive. Various Crown entities will have MOUs with the government about how they're supposed to conduct procurement. They might also have internal policy and internal uh, guidelines that have to be adhered to, and failure to adhere to them can raise problems. Again, we'll go over on December 1st. But focusing on that left-hand column, we have what I like to call the alphabet soup of the trade agreements, because Canada's obligations are extensive, I, I suppose is the best way to put them. As I indicated, Canada has free trade agreements with a wide slew of various entities. One of the key trade agreements in the modern sphere is CETA, or the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with the European Union. Uh, and flowing out of that, for any of uh, our UK audience, the Canada-UK Trade Continuity Agreement, or TCA, has captured the CETA obligations related to the United Kingdom and imposed them into the TCA pending conclusion of a final agreement. This includes the procurement chapter. The CFTA is the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, which is an internal agreement that covers federal procurements, uh, provincial procurements, and sub-provincial procurements, and helps protect Canadian suppliers from regional discrimination. And then the CPTPP, now, it's worth noting, I've just highlighted the key free trade agreements uh, that we've had. There are a wide number of free trade agreements that all have their own procurement chapters. This includes the Canada-Chile free trade agreement. This includes the Canada-South Korea free trade agreement. And you have to always be aware that if you are covered, you are covered by the most strenuous obligations. So even if you have an exemption under one, if you're covered by another free trade agreement, you have to secure exemptions under that one. Finally, you have the World Trade Organization Agreement on Government Procurement, the WTO AGP. This is one of the WTO agreements. It's multilateral between a variety of WTO members that have signed on to open their procurement markets to each other. One interesting note uh, is that we have, of course, CUSMA, or in the United States, the USMCA, which is the agreement that replaced NAFTA. Now, NAFTA back in 1994 was one of the original free trade agreements that really heavily covered government procurement. COSMA does not, at least between Canada and the other parties. So a lot of professionals in the procurement sphere, particularly older professionals, have NAFTA as a touchstone but you have to understand now that that is gone and done with, other than potentially legacy procurements that were begun before COSMA came into force. The new agreement has no obligations between Canada and the other parties. There is a procurement chapter, but it only applies between the United States and Mexico. However, and this is again why the devil's in the details, Canada is still covered for US suppliers and vice versa under the WTO AGP and between Canada and Mexico under the CPTPP. So here's a little slide that when you go over your materials is a handy little cheat sheet. It's very high level and it runs through a number of the trade agreements I've just been discussing and what sectors they apply to. And this is why it's important that COSMA no longer covers Canada, even though the obligations extend into other trade agreements, because each of the trade agreements has a different zone of coverage of what entities it applies to. And some of the trade agreements, for example, CETA or the CFTA, 
will reach down very, very deep and they'll pull up a lot of entities that were previously not covered by rigorous procurement disciplines, such as municipalities and universities and public health units. Whereas others like the WTO AGP is very hands-off at the provincial uh, level. It does cover some provincial entities, typically ministries and official government agencies, but it won't reach down into those sub-federal units as deeply. It's also worth noting, we also have some regional trade agreements. For example, the New West Trade Partnership Agreement or NWAPADA between the Western Canadian provinces of uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and more recently, Manitoba. And this again, reaches down fairly deep sub-federally and it has its own dispute mechanism, which we're gonna get to. So this is the trade agreements at a glance. Now let's start thinking about whether or not a trade agreement applies to you or to the procurement you are participating in. So here we have uh, the application of the trade agreements. The first major barrier, the first major hurdle that you're going to face in considering whether or not a procurement is covered is that it must be a procurement for a governmental purpose. This language of procurement for a governmental purpose is found commonly in the trade agreements. And for such a critical term, for such a gatekeeping term, as you can imagine, is rigorously defined in the agreements. Of course, that is not the case. Of course, it is not rigorously defined in the agreements. In fact, it's left somewhat open as to what for governmental purpose means. However, there is some guidance in most of the trade agreements that will include an explicit exemption for goods or services that are procured for commercial sale or resale. There's also usually a company with a further tax of goods or services for commercial sale or resale or for the production of goods or services for commercial sale or resale. The classic example I like to use is if you are dealing with a liquor control board of some sort that both sells liquor provincially at retail stores, but also engages in licensing of establishments and other regulatory functions. In such a case, any procurement they are doing purely for the commercial retail store side would not be something that is covered by the trade agreements. If a liquor license uh, retail store, a government owned store that would otherwise be a covered entity is procuring pallets of scotch to resell, they don't have to go out to a public tender to get the scotch uh, under the trade agreements. However, if their back office is procuring uh, computer software to use for the furtherance of the regulatory function, for the licensing function, then that's likely going to be for the governmental purpose. Now, sometimes you get very bright, clean lines, and those are very nice and easy. But sometimes you'll end up in a situation where there's a question of, is this for a governmental or non-governmental purpose? For example, we're engaged in mass transit and the trains, and people are going to be using them on a commercial basis, but they're going to be subsidized. Is that government or not government purpose? Uh, we are doing various other projects that might have software that we're procuring to both use to help sell goods to the public, but also using back office to try to use on our own software and our own systems. Is that a governmental or non-governmental purpose? This is a very tricky area and really requires a lot of careful fact-specific analysis to determine whether or not a particular procurement will fit into that category. Now, it's also worth noting that this procurement obligation doesn't just include purchases. It's not just I'm buying something. It can be for leasing. It can be for leasing with an option to purchase or leasing without the option to purchase. It could be used for retaining services of a service provider on an interim basis. It can even apply to situations where you are arranging with a service provider to provide a service that an end user will pay for. And we're gonna cover that on the valuation slides. So you can't think that you can come up with a clever structure. There is no one weird trick that procurement lawyers hate. Uh, there are many weird tricks that procurement lawyers hate, but there's no one weird trick to get around the trade agreements that procurement lawyers hate. You can't just structure your way out of this, uh, these obligations.
Finally, it's worth noting that the critical question will always be a tripartite question to determine coverage. It must be a procurement by a covered entity. It must be a procurement of a covered good or service. And it must be a procurement over a minimum threshold. These are all requirements that are set out in each one of the trade agreements, and they are very specific. So what do I mean by by a covered entity? Well, the question of by a covered entity is looking at uh, the trade agreements coverage schedules. Now, inside each of the trade agreements, there are annexes right after the procurement chapter. For example, in CETA, the uh, procurement chapter is chapter 19. The annexes are chapter 19A, 19B, 19C. As you run through those annexes, the first three annexes are typically Canada's schedule of covered entities, the province's schedule of covered entities, and then Canada and the province's combined schedule of what I call crown entities, or sometimes called commercial or industrial entities. In Canada, these are usually crown corporations that are covered at the various levels. Each treaty has their own particular commitments. However, it's worth noting some are much broader than others. For example, the CFTA, Canadian Free Trade Agreement, is an exceptionally broad trade agreement that covers nearly every uh, public entity in Canada. Uh, it covers nearly every provincial entity. It has what we would call a negative list approach to coverage by covering everything that is not specifically carved out for most of the provinces involved. And so if you are considering whether or not the procurement you are bidding on is covered, or if you are a purchaser wondering whether or not you are covered, you are almost certainly covered by the CFTA unless you're specifically exempted. And usually these exemptions are focused on the legislative assemblies and the House of Parliament and the Library of Parliament. Uh, for a variety of constitutional reasons, they're kept segregated. Some of the trade agreements will also build in exemptions for Canada's intelligence and security apparatus, as well as the military typically has either no coverage or heavily restricted coverage in the next chapter on the what. It's also worth noting that most of you are probably going to be covered if you are a purchaser by some agreement, but you might be covered by multiple agreements. This is where it becomes very important. If you are being covered by multiple agreements, you must comply with all of them. So you must always comply with the most rigorous standard. Uh, regardless of whether or not you could get away with something uh, more open or more flexible under another trade agreement. The next question is of good cover goods and services. So are your goods and services covered? Now, again, the treaties have treaty specific schedules that discuss whether or not a good or a service will be a covered good or service. These usually come immediately after the annexes describing who the covered entities are. There's one chapter or one annex for goods, one annex for services, and one annex for construction services. If you are procuring goods with very narrow exceptions, such as military weapons purchases, some mass transit vehicles in certain provinces, but generally speaking, if you are purchasing a good, it's going to be covered nearly all goods are covered goods. So if you're buying word processing software, if you are buying uh, licenses for word processing software, don't wanna get too fancy. Uh, if you are buying pens, paper, desks, snow plows, uh, ships, regardless of what you're purchasing, it is probably going to be covered as a durable good or as a fungible good. Either case, you're gonna be covered. Services are a lot more tricky. Um, which is interesting as services are becoming an increasing part of both the economy as a whole and public procurement markets in particular. Services are covered generally under the CFTA. Once again, the CFTA does not have a separate annex for services. So it's only if a province in its schedule has explicitly exempted certain services or specifically narrowed their group of services being offered, the services will be covered by the CFTA. 
However, Canada's other trade agreements go with what we call a positive list approach, which means that services are only covered by another trade agreement if they are specifically listed in that trade agreement. Now you might think, well, that's great. They provide a list, it's nice, clean and easy. The problem is Canada first did these agreements, as I said, back with uh, NAFTA. And at the time they are drafting it, they use what's called the United Nations Central Product Classification Provisional Version 1.01, I believe. That was the most up-to-date version. It was published in 1991. That was what was used. Ever since then, for the sake of consistency and for the sake of making sure that we are having apples to apples comparisons across our trade agreements and our coverages, Canada has used that CPC provisional uh, document to guide its services classifications. That document is now fairly outdated. It can be difficult to find online, especially as there's now more modern versions of the CPC and even more modern provisional CPCs. So you can't just rely on the fact that it says provisional. You have to find the very specific version that applies. And why do you need to find this? Because in the trade agreements, when it's listing what entities are covered, it provides a nested hierarchy. Now, I'm a giant nerd. I don't know if anyone else is a giant nerd here, but I always loved biology when I was a high school student. I always loved the way that you had the nested hierarchy of your know, species, family, genus, and you know the names get longer and longer as you get the more and more the taxonomy of what the animal is. Uh, same thing in the customs tariff in my world. We have a chapter and a subchapter, and the goods get more and more detailed. And the more digits you add, to the code associated with the good, the more detailed the description, but it all fits under that initial chapter. The same thing happens with the CPC provisional. It has a number of chapters that divide at very high levels, for example, consulting services, architectural services, and that might be at a two digit chapter level, database services. Then it will go down a step, it'll say database management might be one sub chapter. So database might be, say, chapter 56. Database management might be 56.1. Database construction might be 56.2. And they might separate those out. And then they might separate into another subfactor for 36.1.1 uh, for database uh, management, financial, et cetera, as it branches out and gets more detailed. Now, some of the obligations in the trade agreement are managed at a very detailed code, so like a five-digit code for how detailed the uh, commitment is. Some of them might only give the topmost two digits for the chapter. It might just be database management. In such a case, it captures every subchapter and every subheading at that level and below. So everything gets swept up. If it's above, it's not automatically covered. And so you have to very carefully parse through what the precise commitment is, go to the CPC to look at how it's described because it always provides a description of what types of things qualify for that particular heading or for that particular description, and then see if what you're procuring fits under that services chapter. Finally, you have construction services. And uh, construction services uh, are also defined under the CPC. Again, this is the Central Product Classification Provisional from the United Nations. Uh, and under the CPC, there is a separate chapter for construction services that handles construction services from the design phase all the way to the end of the build and the commissioning phase. So it captures the whole way through. Construction services are a little bit easier than regular services because typically our trade agreements cover all construction services holistically. Having said that, there are certain exemptions and I have one noted here, for example, in CETA, if you look at the construction services commitment, there's, it doesn't say P3 projects are exempt, but it provides a, a, a very specific definition and wording of what a P3 project is from a principled basis, and then exempts it from large swaths of the trade agreement. Now, this brings up one area I wanted to touch on in particular, because I think there's a degree of laziness in some of the thought around this, and that when people hear P3s are exempt, or that there is a P3 exemption under the trade agreements. They frequently think, okay, well, I'm doing a P3, wash my hands, I'm done, I don't have to worry. 
most of the trade agreements that have P3 exemptions don't exempt P3s generally. They exempt P3s from specific commitments. For example, the CFTA exempts uh, P3s from certain transparency and process requirements that would slow down or impede the bidding process and robs the bidding process of flexibility. But it does not necessarily exempt the procurement from certain other substantive commitments on, for example, non-discrimination. So it's very important to figure in where your uh, P3 is, if you are running a P3, what uh, disciplines you're exempt from and what particular commitments you're covered by. The last issue that touches on whether or not you're a covered procurement is the threshold. And this is over a minimum threshold because quite frankly, we don't want you to have to do a full procurement if you're buying, you know, $1,000 worth of printer paper. That would be absurd to force you to go through a treaty compliant process to do a procurement on that front. That's much more likely either, depending on your departmental policy as a purchaser, would be something that you would do either as a, a matter of just purchase or maybe get three quotes. It would depend upon your specific policy. So each of the trade agreements has a specific threshold that you have to clear to be covered. And if you fall below that threshold, it's not a covered procurement, even if it's of a covered good or service and by a covered entity. Now the procurement thresholds are specific to each entity that is procuring because we divide them into groups based upon those annexes that I mentioned. Again, like for example, see that the 19A entities, the federal government entities will have a different procurement limit than the 19B, uh, the provincial entities, which will have a different limit than the uh, crown entities and crown corporations. And typically federal government agencies and federal government ministries have very low thresholds and crown corporations uh, and municipalities and other smaller entities have much higher thresholds because we wanna give more flexibility to corporate entities uh, and we want to give more flexibility to smaller entities that don't have the entire Department of Public Works behind them to help them with their purchasing. So I've listed here the CETA, it might be the CFTA, but I believe it's the CETA limits. And you can see how it divides between a separate limit for goods and services and construction services and separate limits for federal government, municipal governments, or crown corporations. Now, these numbers look a little bit funny. You think, well, they're not round numbers. That's a little bit odd. That's because all of these numbers are indexed and they're meant to keep up with the inflation rate. And most of the trade agreements index roughly on a biannual basis. The CFTA, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement Secretariat, maintains a website that they maintain the current thresholds based upon the indexing formula in that particular trade agreement. It's also worth noting for the uh, international trade agreements, for example, uh, for the uh, CPTPP and CETA, that these are typically expressed under the metric of uh, special drawing rights, which is a fictional basket of currencies that are meant to hedge against exchange rates. The last thing I want to say on this slide is that you have to include all your options and renewals when you're calculating value. You cannot just say build a $5,000 procurement with a $2 million option that you may or may not pick up and say, well, it's only a $5,000 procurement. You have to factor that cost in. You also have to factor in third party payments. And this is the case I promised you earlier. It's a Bell Canada case involving a uh, supply to prisoners in uh, Corrections Canada of telephone services where the argument by Canada for why they didn't have to comply with the trade agreements was Canada was paying no money. The procurement was run such that the uh, prisoners would pay for access to the winning proponent. So the prisoners would pay, not the government, and because there was no flow from government to, uh, supplier, there's no coverage. The Canadian International Trade Tribunal roundly rejected that analysis and they said, no, 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 the critical question here isn't, is money flowing from Canada to the purchaser? It's, is the purchaser supplying a governmental service or acting as a governmental uh, service provider 
and getting remuneration for it? And if so, how much? What's the estimated value to them of that contract? That's the key question when answering the value proposition. So having dealt with that, we then have the question of, uh, oh, sorry, I had a small technical issue. We then have the three types of procurements, open, selective, and limiting. I'm gonna go over this reasonably quickly. Open tendering, as you can imagine, is something that all of you have probably done. It's a standard RFP process, soup to nuts, easy peasy. The next option is selective tendering. Now, selective tendering is also, is sometimes run as a pre-qualification. It's something that's specifically allowed by the trade agreements. We frequently see pre-qual processes done in complex procurements, and it's usually done to limit the number of suppliers or to eliminate looky-loos uh, who have no capability to actually perform the contract. You have to remember that there are procedural rules that will apply that we'll discuss in a moment on timelines, on biasing specifications, et cetera, that apply equally to pre-qualification. Pre-qualification documents are considered tender documents under the uh, rules of the trade agreements. And so you have to treat them with the same uh, care and consideration as you would treat the final RFP. The second use that's also explicitly allowed is that uh, what we would call a multi-use list which is uh, something used typically for purchases of less uh, complex goods, where you can either come up with a list of approved suppliers that you will just pull from, say on a cap rank basis, or on a proportionate basis, or you can run a mini RFP with only the selected pre-approved bidders as part of that mini list. Either of those, any of those options are acceptable. The trade agreements specifically allow this type of multi-use list approach to selective tendering. However, this is only allowed if, number one, the selective tender is done in compliance with the trade agreements when it's put out. And two, you have to provide an on-ramp. You can't just come up with your list and say, I have my list. We are good from now until the water wears down the mountain were set. You have to allow new entrants an opportunity at least once a year to jump onto the list as a purchaser. And so if you're a supplier and you know a list exists, you should be trying to follow up to find out when that open period is coming up again so that you can apply to get on the list of suppliers. Now, common obligations uh, for limited tendering is a word that should send some fear down your spine. I know I myself, my stomach crumples a bit whenever I get asked about limited tendering, also known as direct negotiation, also known as uh, a sole source contract award. Sole sourcing is technically allowed. There is a provision to allow for sole sourcing under Canada's trade agreements. However, it is very tightly restricted. As a starting point, you must be sure that the purpose of that sole source is not to avoid competition or discriminate against the suppliers based on origin. Even if you can technically find an exemption that would apply, if there's a paper trail that can be followed back, that can be shown that the reason you are running it is to avoid competition, your goose done be cooked. There's nothing you can do at that stage. Uh, if you go in front of the CITT, they will find against you if you fail that chapeau, if you fail that preliminary gate. But let's say you aren't doing that for that reason. You believe you have a bona fide reason to sole source a particular contract. You still must fit within one of a number of specific exemptions. And the first and most common exemption is if no one actually submits a tender, uh, a bid to your uh, solicitation, or if all of the bids submitted are non-compliant, if you just have no compliant tenders, if no one can actually supply the RFP you've put out through the open process, there is a justification under the trade agreements to go out and directly award a substantially unmodified tender. So something that is substantively identical to what you put out. Now, before you run off and say, Robert Glasgow decided to say, I can go do this, 
Keep in mind, this is very fact specific, both on justifying that there were no compliant tenders, but also fact specific on the substantially unmodified nature of the direct award. Both of those are gonna come under incredibly heavy scrutiny. The second common time that we see sole sourcing is when you have only one bidder or only one supplier that you think can do a contract. Most commonly, this is due to interoperability concerns. This is due to uh, compatibility with existing software or hardware or other uh, solutions to make sure that all the bits you know, fit together properly. That is an acceptable reason, and that's why there's also an ex exception for procuring more of a supply from an existing supplier that won a competitive process in the past. But the compatibility threshold is high. It's not enough to say, in order to make the systems work together, for example, we'll have to undergo additional work, that the supplier will have to do some additional customization the supplier will have to incur additional expense. You can you know, force them to price in any expense of making sure compatibility exists. We can put the risk of ensuring compatibility and the cost of ensuring compatibility with existing systems on the bidders. But if it's possible to make those systems work together, you can almost certainly not use the compatibility justification under the trade agreements. The same thing comes with IP concerns. There are sometimes times when purchasers want to purchase a particular IP. Again, that will only work if it is truly necessary. If there is no other option, that is typically the threshold we are looking at for limited tendering. And the final exemption, and this is actually one that I haven't seen used before, but it's one that's probably most understandable is extreme urgency. If there's a company that's undergoing a CCAA or a bankruptcy filing and is conducting a fire sale where they are selling you know, a particular office furniture that you need to procure a large amount of for pennies on the dollar, that would be a good time that you could potentially do a direct award to purchase the incredibly cut price goods due to that kind of urgency. But it's worth noting when we're talking about urgency, that can also not be self-inflicted. So if you have neglected to start a process until you know, 11.59 on the clock, you can't say, well, now we're hold up, we have a minute to finish this, we gotta just go out and award it. If the urgency is self-inflicted, it's a case of too bad, so sad. You'll just have to live with the additional cost of trying to tide yourself over. Uh, the next, Entry, of course, the common obligation is minimum time periods. I'm going to try to be quick because I know we have a few questions already. And a reminder, you can put your questions in the Q&A, uh, and I will see them and they'll pop up. Uh, but I want to touch just quickly on some of the common obligations, such as time periods. Here is a question of reasonability. You must ensure that bidders all have what we would call sufficient time to submit their bids. And the sufficient time is highly contextual and touches on uh, the question of where the suppliers are doing what they're trying to supply. If you have a very simple product, it's a fungible good, you're just buying a large amount of, you might not need much time or need to allocate much time to actually allowing bidders to put together a bid. If you are trying to procure a complicated IT cloud-based solution that's trying to bring together multiple departments in your particular government or purchasing entity that all have their own demands in a very long spec sheet, that might be something that requires a lot more time to put a bid together on. So the complexity of the tender is going to be a huge part of how much time is considered sufficient. It's also worth noting that some trade agreements like CETA have specific time limits. They have minimum numbers of days that goods must come in. Uh, it's the typical uh, limit is 40 days that can be reduced down to 25 and then 15 if you take certain preparatory steps like run a pre-qualification and allow electronic bid submission, you can drill that down. But this is, and you'll excuse the nerdy reference, this is what I call the Bennigan's rule, which is do you really wanna do the absolute minimum? which is not the way you can operate for a lot of these. When we're looking at these time limits that have minimum thresholds, you have to clear both that minimum and ensure that it is sufficient. 
even if you beat that minimum clock, if you've cut it short and it's insufficient time for a bidder to properly prepare a response, that would be a violation of the trade agreements. Uh, the next is conditions of participation. Again, this should be limited only to essential criteria, it should be focused on financial and legal capacity and technical abilities. But it's worth noting, and the one thing I want to highlight on these slides, are the two things I want to highlight. Number one, you have to assess the supplier globally. Uh, unless it's a procurement caught purely by the CFTA, if you have, say, a CETA bound procurement, you have to allow this uh, bidder to include any experience they have, for example, in the European Union. Uh, you have to allow them to present their capabilities holistically and broadly. You also cannot, for example, require that they have experience specifically in Canada. And there might be some wiggle room if you're dealing with a hyper-specific problem that would only be faced in a Canadian environment. But even then, it would be better to describe the environment that they have to have experience in. And then if that just happens to only be in Canada, that just happens to only be in Canada. Now, when I say describe the environment, I don't mean you have to have experience in paving Young Street between Richmond and Dundas. That's an environment. I'm, I'm talking about climactically uh, and you know, urban, et cetera. The next thing I want to highlight is that there is no litigation debar, which is something that I, I get asked a lot about. You know, a supplier is uh, engaged in litigation with the purchaser. Well, that should that supplier be debarred from bidding? My answer is no. Uh, I know that this is something that does come up to some debate. Uh, there are grounds you can exclude suppliers for fraud, for failure to perform, uh, et cetera. But my answer on the debar is generally speaking, that would only kick in if you have successfully debarred uh, the uh, engaged in a successful litigation debar. Uh, is a, a successful piece of litigation. Because until that point, the supplier might be accused of failure to perform. But what if they win? Then you've just barred them from a procurement in the absence of actually proving that they have been insufficient to meeting the particular needs of the procurement. The next is uh, technical specifications. I wanna highlight here, you want performance specs, not necessarily uh, descriptive specs. You want to use ISOs and international standards more than national standards or descriptions. And you want to try to avoid uh, IP related terms or other protected or trademark terms. For example, uh, you can have a procurement for a Cisco brand router. That would be something that would probably not meet the test. What you would want to do is find the specifications of what that Cisco brand router does uh, what's important, what bands it transmits on, what its signal strength is, what its range is, uh, what channels it operates on, and translate those into a specification to describe what you're looking for. If you do find that you have to use a trademark name or a brand description, you definitely should be using, or a purchaser should be using, if you're a supplier looking at that procurement, an equivalency there should be an ability to demonstrate equivalency between what a supplier wants to provide and what the spec calls for. Finally, uh, bid evaluation is another major area that we can end up with some uh, common litigation issues. And here, one of the key issues we're gonna face is um, hidden criteria. Now, hidden criteria are uh, those that are not provided in the trade agreements, because all of the trade agreements requires suppliers to fully describe what's being procured and what weighting is given to particular evaluations. Now, you might say, if I'm a purchaser and I give suppliers the list of evaluation criteria and the weights that I'm assigning to each criteria, they're going to game the system to get them the maximum number of points. And the answer to that is, Yes, that is exactly what is going to happen. And that is exactly what the CITT has said should happen in a trade agreement covered procurement, at least at the federal level. The CITT has consistently taken the position that suppliers have a right to know how to maximize their bid. They have a right to know how to make their bid 
as attractive as possible to a purchaser. It is almost certainly insufficient, for example, to list the criteria you're going to use and to say these are the criteria. If you did that, at least at the federal level, the CITT would likely take the position that you are binding yourself to evaluate all of those criteria equally with equal weighting on each criteria. Now you might say, well, okay, if I'm a purchaser, I will say these are the criteria and I will weight them unevenly at my discretion. There is a uh, relatively famous case, it's CGI and Canada Post Corps, where the government actually did that. And for procedural reasons, CGI actually did not win that case on this point because they were out of time. And I'll talk about limitations periods in just a sec. But the tribunal was very clear in their obitur statements that that kind of just blanket, we will weight them unevenly at our discretion, would not pass the test for being sufficient description of the weights on criteria. So if a, a purchaser is using unstated criteria to evaluate, if they're introducing new tests into the evaluation handbook that aren't described in the solicitation documents, that's going to be a big area of litigation. The other one, of course, being your standard bias allegations. Finally, I want to touch on one last common obligation, which is negotiation protocols, just because this will tie into what we're going to be discussing in two weeks on negotiable RFPs. It should be noted that the trade agreements do include provisions for uh, rank and run, uh, BAFO, uh, and BAFO uh, negotiating procurement obligations, uh, BAFO best and final offer. So you can either do a ranked bidder approach, or you can do a concurrent negotiations approach. Those are both allowed under the trade agreements. However, you must describe what your negotiations protocol is going to be in your solicitations documents, and you must stick to that uh, methodology. So I'm quickly running out of time. I do want to get to the question, so I'm just going to jump through the disputes systems. All of the trade agreements require there to be a system set up to allow for supplier challenges, and they must be set up to allow for speedy challenges with interim measures available from independent adjudicators. At the federal level, this is the Canadian International Trade Tribunal. They have now about 30 years of experience doing procurement cases. They have a statutory time limit, cradle to grave of 90 days can be extended one time by up to 35, uh, 45 more days, but then it's done. There is no way to extend beyond that outside date. So it is incredibly rapid justice and a justice system that typically takes a very long time. They also have broad remedy powers that they can cancel contracts, order reevaluation, order uh, a purchaser or recommend, I should say, but it's really in order, a purchaser to cancel a contract and redo an entire tender. They can also have partial uh, standstill powers because they can prevent the award of a contract, but they cannot prevent the performance of an already awarded contract. Finally, they have a very strict limitations period. This is what I was talking about for uh, the CGI in Canada post case, where they came in, the tribunal held more than 10 business days after they knew or reasonably ought to have known that they had a complaint, and therefore they were time barred from making that particular complaint. Uh, then you have the bid dispute mechanism for the Western provinces in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Uh, these provinces all have uh, specific bid protest mechanisms that are built into their domestic legislation through the Nwapada Secretariat. Uh, it does not give the ability to seek lost profits awards, but it can give bid preparation costs, and it also has its own very strict time limit to bringing a dispute. The other provinces uh, that I am aware of, the answer is uh, the other provinces don't have, uh, as far as I have uh, found, specific uh, methodologies and mechanisms or arbitral bodies have been set up. Ontario now has a single point of supply of Supply Ontario that has a complaint system. Uh, that's almost only not sufficient to meet the obligations under the trade agreements for how complaints are supposed to be adjudicated. Uh, the common thought would be that, generally speaking, you would have to seek a judicial review application 
on the basis that uh, the uh, various government bodies that are created as creatures of statute of the province uh, and are bound by, for example, their own procurement directives or by the province's rules or by the broader public sector procurement directives uh, have to follow the trade agreements as a part of their duties of procedural fairness to bidders and that a breach of the trade agreements is a prima facie breach of procedural fairness. That's probably the thread that you would have to try to, to weave to bring a procurement complaint in Ontario. There might be a new way with this new complaint process to instead JR the complaint decision if you think it does not accurately capture the trade agreements. We'll just have to wait and see how this develops. So common mistakes. Uh, the first one is the limitations period. And we get back to that CGI case where you bring the complaint uh, more than 10 days after you knew or reasonably ought to have known. And because that complaint was about uh, improperly or hidden criteria or criteria that were not weighted in the evaluation in the solicitation documents, the tribunal takes the position that you know that those criteria are hidden or that the weights are hidden when you get the documents. So when that RFP is released, they also assume that you as a supplier are clicking through and waiting for RFPs to be released and that you keep on top of it. So there's a presumption of knowledge either at the RFP release date or shortly thereafter. So you have to be, if you are a supplier, you absolutely have to be on your toes. You cannot wait and think, I think this criteria might be a little bit shady, but I'm just gonna bid and things don't work out, I'll complain. Because if you do that, there's a good chance that you'll be found to have a torn to that shady criteria. Now, you might be able to find shelter in saying that the uh, hidden criteria or that the bias criteria is a latent defect and not patent, that it's something that's not revealed until you see how the evaluation is done. But then you have to fight about whether or not it is obvious on the face of the documents that the criteria is biased or that the criteria says what it says. And that's a fight that can be difficult to win. So it's always better to get on the phone, give me a call or give one of my other practitioners a call to go over documents earlier rather than later if you think you might have a complaint as a supplier. Uh, the second issue is typically choosing the wrong form. Uh, this can be whether or not you're a covered entity. Uh, and this ties into the failure to structure your bid teams correctly. There are a lot of procurements out there by, for example, the Canadian Forces or the Ministry of National Defense that are only covered substantively by the CFTA. And if you are an EU supplier, even if you are using a Canadian sub to do most of the work, if you are the bidder as the EU entity, you have no uh, CFTA coverage if that Canadian entity isn't a bidder. And this is something like we actually have firsthand experience where we were successful in helping to kick out the complaint by Leonardo SPA against the fixed wing search and rescue aircraft procurement. Uh, that is a procurement we helped defend and we were successful on that basis. Similarly, it's not enough to say that a contract will be entered into with a Canadian entity if again, the bidder is a foreign entity. And that gets into the Allian uh, Technologies case, which was brought around the Canadian Surface Combatants Program. That is another case that we helped uh, get kicked again on the grounds to be a Canadian supplier under the trade agreements, under the CFTA, you must be a Canadian entity. And so this is very well trammeled law at the CITT. So if you think you might be engaged in CFTA covered procurement and you want the protection of the CFTA, you should structure, if at all possible, through a Canadian entity. Now that said, I do want to touch just before the questions, this is the last slide I promise, that there is one exemption to this, which is the bid protest mechanism under NWAPADA. There is actually at least one case uh, that went before an arbitrator that I'm fairly sure was not a trade lawyer and the parties I am fairly sure were not uh, represented by counsel that appear before the CITT and have experience with the trade agreements. And that's because you have to understand that as a Canadian supplier, you get access to every trade agreement because all of our trade agreements and all of our other procurement agreements protect suppliers of a party. And Canada is a party to all of these agreements. So if you are a Canadian supplier, you get the protection of the CFTA, of CETA, of the CPTPP, of the WTO AGP, everything. 
even for procurements by Canada. And it doesn't matter that it's not a procurement by the other country or by one of the other parties to the agreement. You get that protection vis-a-vis -vis the Canadian and the various sub-federal entities. The bid protest mechanism case, uh, it was a Alberta company challenging an Alberta government decision that the arbitrator said there is no what we would call multiplicity of nationality or multiplicity of provinciality here. The arbitrator held that the purpose of the agreements was to protect discrimination against foreign suppliers, in this case, extra provincial suppliers. Therefore, you could not complain about your own province's procurements. This is almost certainly wrong. There is no way that you can read the plain reading of the text of the CFTA and come to that conclusion. That case is almost certainly wrong, and I would hope in the future that it just gets dropped and the CITT's approach gets adopted. So turning to questions now, and I already have a number in queue, so I'm just going to address these questions as they came up. Uh, the first question I have here is, uh, can I walk through how municipalities are bound by trade treaties, given that municipalities are creatures of statute, the Municipal Act, and how, for example, are the obligations flowed down from the provincial government to the municipality? And what's the uh, mechanism for this? So this would largely be a, a question of particular provincial law. And this would be getting into questions of how the provincial government has structured um, what's going on and how it's going to do procurements. All of the provinces, some of them, for example, in Alberta and in the Western provinces that have uh, set up uh, systems for the bid protest mechanism, I believe there's specific legislation that ties domestic review mechanisms and requires compliance with the trade agreements. Many other provinces also have various uh, policy guidelines, for example, the broader public sector procurement directives. Uh, there is also the fact that the uh, municipalities as creatures of statute of the province are bound by the decisions that the province commits to uh, extraterritorially through these treaties. It's a complicated response. Uh, I don't have time to do it justice, but if you want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk afterwards. The next question I have here is uh, pre-qualification lists can be closed, not open annually if less than three years. Uh, and that term is clearly say when the procurement is posted. That is the case, I believe, definitely for CETA. I believe that the CFTA may have a, a more often requirement to open it up, uh, but I'd have to double check on that one. The next question is, uh, there are no references to the territories in my presentation. Do these procurement rules apply to the three territories? Uh, I, I do believe they do, and that's my mistake, and I apologize for not specifically referencing territories. Uh, however, it's also important to note, when I was talking about exemptions, there's also one very large exemption that would likely apply to a large number of procurements by the territorial governments, which is uh, there's a procurement for uh, procurement uh, and biasing procurement in favor of uh, it depends on the wording of the treaty. Sometimes it's indigenous persons and businesses, sometimes aboriginal persons and businesses. Uh, the trade agreements make clear that Canada is allowed to derogate and the various sub-federal entities are allowed to derogate for the purpose of supporting indigenous and aboriginal businesses and communities. Uh, so a lot of those, even if there are procurement commitments, a lot of times those exemptions could apply to help support local economies. Uh, there's also typically in many of the trade agreements exemptions for supporting and measures taken and procurements done uh, to support life in uh, Northern Canada, partly as a recognition that a lot of times when you're dealing with uh, Northern Canadian jurisdictions, including the territories, the Northern parts of provinces, that those remote areas can require special attention and uh, special systems that might not lend themselves well to open procurements with bidders, particularly those that don't have a lot of experience operating in those conditions. Uh, the next question I have here is, are broader public sector entities, e.g. hospitals, exempt from uh, compliance with these procurement requirements if using non-public funds, such as money from private donors? I do not believe that's the case so long as uh, they are, uh, if, if there's a mix. I believe there is an exemption if it's a purely philanthropic uh, endeavor, 
there is a specific philanthropic exemption in the trade agreements. What I would recommend is if you are thinking about conducting procurement in that way, uh, that you get in touch with a trade lawyer uh, or with a procurement specialist to walk through the philanthropic exemption to make sure it ticks all the boxes for you to exempt the procurement from uh, those services. Also, it's worth noting one other exemption that applies, and this is why the devil's in the details, and this is a deep dive, but it's as deep a dive as we can do in about an hour. Uh, there are a variety of exemptions for specific services, especially in the health and social services area, but it's worth noting that it's for health services and not necessarily for other services. So health services and providing healthcare services would be exempted, but potentially database management services for the hospital or for a, a health unit would, would still be covered because the database management is not a health service. The biggest area this comes in is diagnostic testing and lab testing is an area that there is a lot of very careful analysis in that CPC provisional to find out whether or not the specific types of testing being done fits into lab testing or into the health services uh, sector. So that's something that, again, you should always be on the watch out for. Finally, can I name a good reference or references to the materials covered in the presentation? Um, so there's me, give me a call. I, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we can talk through various issues about trade law related issues and about the treaties. Uh, there is a loose leaf that's published by David Atwater uh, that's uh, updated. It's now an e-loose leaf, I believe, through Thomson Reuters. Uh, and that's Atwater, I believe it's A-T-T-W-A-T-E-R. Uh, that's an exceptionally good uh, resource for trade agreement related procurement issues. And then the other main text used by procurement professionals and by lawyers is the Paul Emanuele text on government procurement, which is excellent, uh, but it's a bit more broader based. The Atwater is focused almost purely on trade agreement related issues, whereas the Emanuele text is based on a more wide ranging uh, sampling of contract A issues, negotiable RFP issues, and some trade issues. It's not as strong on the trade issues as the Atwater piece, but it is still a very good text and he's an excellent lawyer. So I think that answers the questions I have. I have gone three minutes over the time. Uh, I see that we've kept most people here. Uh, and I want to thank you all for listening to me ramble on. I like nothing more than having the chance to give a talk. Uh, I hope to see many of you back here on December 1st when we will be going over part two and discussing the very interesting topic of negotiable RFP formats, uh, contract A and contract A damages and how the two interact and how we might be able to help you escape from the pitfalls of contract A. If you're a supplier and interested in that purchase in that particular CPD presentation, I strongly encourage you to come on because we'll also be dealing with this from a supplier's perspective and how to protect your rights even when contract A is not there to save you. Thank you very much, and I hope you all have an excellent day.